continue with this example, um, except that what I want to do is I want to think about it in the opposite direction. So we started with this geometric series here. Right here. And said it's going to converge to the leading term over 1 minus the common ratio. If the absolute value of the common ratio is less than 1. We identified the leading term A and the common ratio x minus 3 over 4. Use this formula, saw that it's going to equal this expression as long as x is strictly between negative 1 and 7. Well, that's a function of x. And so we can make a graph, and we saw graphically that these things do match up. Exactly when x is strictly between negative 1 and 7, if you think about the infinite sum, and approximately with these partial sums. Let's pretend we were trying to go the other way. So pretend that we started with a function 20 over 7 minus x. And for some strange reason, we wanted to um, estimate this function with polynomials when x is close to 3. You might wonder why you'd want to do such a thing, and that would be a good question. After all, with technology, we just plug these things in our calculators or Mathematica, and why would we want to approximate this function with polynomials when x is close to 3? Okay, so humor me, me as far as purpose. Let's just try to do it. Having knowledge about geometric series, and in particular this knowledge that a plus ar plus ar squared plus ar cubed, etc., equals a over 1 minus r when the absolute value of r is less than 1, we still have that knowledge. And we look at that right there, and say, hmm, a over 1 minus r, this almost looks like something over 1 minus r. Almost. There, there's really only one fly in the ointment. The 7 there is not a 1. The 20 is no problem. The minus x is no problem. I guess the r is x if we were thinking about it that way. But the 7 seems to be preventing us from like using this formula backwards. And if we could use the formula backwards, actually with r involving x minus 3, then we might get a, a polynomial or an infinite series of this form. And we could truncate it, consider a partial sum of it to approximate our function well near x equals 3. And those graphs were close together when x was close to 3. That should work, even if it doesn't seem useful necessarily. What kind of trick do you need to do to make it work here? Um, well, first of all, I want to get an x minus 3 there instead of an x. So how do you do that? Well, you don't see an x minus 3 there, so put it there. And you scratch your head and say, is that, is that right? Is that OK? Well, as is, it's not OK. But we can always adjust. Compensate by subtracting 3 over there. Why subtract 3? Because I'm really adding 3 when I put the 3, the minus 3 there. And the minus there. 2 minuses make a plus. Plus 3, so I have to subtract 3 off to say these two things are equal. Hmm, that doesn't look like it's any better. Well, OK, I can combine the 7 and the minus 3 to get a 4. 20 over 4 minus x minus 3. So that two-step calculation does have the benefit of getting me to something involving an x minus 3 there. The 7 has become a 4. I'd like it to be a 1 instead. So how can I make it a 1? Well, another little trick. Factor a 4 out. Like that. Twenty over this product 
is equal to that. I factored a 4 out. I compensated for factoring the 4 out by putting a 1 there and a divide by 4 there. And now 20 divided by 4, that's 5. That's now in the form something over 1 minus something. A is 5. R is x minus 3 over 4. It worked. This equals 5 plus 5 times x minus 3 over 4 plus 5 times x minus 3 over 4 quantity squared plus 5 times x minus 3 over 4 quantity cubed etc., which does simplify to exactly this. We did it in reverse with some tricky algebra. Again, whether this is useful or not, we're not worrying about it. Okay. We do know from these graphs that they are close together near x equals 3. They're real good math when x is close to 3. In fact, they're such a good match, I wonder if not only their function values of 3 are equal, but maybe their derivatives at 3, and their second derivatives at 3, and their third derivatives at 3, etc. Maybe those are equal too. Let's test that out. Let me call 20 minus 7 over x. Let me call that f of x. f of x is 20 over 7 minus x. And should we do the finite sum? Yeah, let's do the finite sum. Let's call this g sub n of x. I'll use a subscript. Uh, there's a button over here in the basic math. This is the first subscript right there. g sub n. Actually, let me use something other than g. Um, p. p for polynomial. p sub n of x. And in mathematics, mind, both n and x are variable quantities, so they both need underscores when you're first defining this. I could have called this s for partial sum as well, but I'm calling it p for polynomial. f of 0 is, uh, f of 3 is what I meant to calculate, f of 3 is 5. Let's pick a specific value of n. p sub 10 of 3 is also 5. Whoop. I did that one, that worked. Oh, it didn't like it. Okay, Mathematica is now liking there being a 0 to the 0 power. Hmm. Remember I said the notation is not without a small wrinkle. Right? x equals a then you get the 0 to the 0 power. I can fix that. Let me change this to a 1, and let me put a 5 out in front of it like that. That'll fix it. They're both 5. What about their derivatives at 3? They're both high force. What about their second derivatives at 3? They're both 5 eighths. What about their third derivatives at 3? They're the same thing still. What about their tenth derivatives at 3? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. The same! What about their eleventh derivative at 3? Different because I made n 10. Okay, if I made n 11, their 11th derivatives would be the same. Their 
n plus 1 terms here. This is called a Taylor polynomial of degree n, because the highest power is n. If n is 10, well, it's the Taylor polynomial for f of degree 10 It's constructed in such a way that those derivatives match all the way up through the tenth derivative. Through the tenth derivative. If I picked n to be 20, all the derivatives of 3 would match up through the 20th derivative. So the infinite series thought of as being a limit of partial sums. Well, the partial sums, these Taylor polynomials they're called, are constructed in a way to make the function value is the same at a, which is 3. Their derivative is the same at a, which is 3. Their second derivative is the same. Their third, their fourth, their fifth, etc. Maybe it, because of that, it shouldn't be surprising that those functions are so close together near x equals 3. Because you made their, all their derivatives match up at 3, up to a certain point. And in the infinite sum, as long as it converges on some interval around 3, which it does, all the derivatives match. If I used an infinite sum, <clears throat> maybe I'll even call it p sub infinity of x. Copy and paste this. Replace the n with an infinity. Then we're going to get the derivatives matching up no matter how many primes we put in here. Let me add, just sort of arbitrarily, seven more primes. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. They're the same. The infinite sum has all of its derivatives at three matching. Why are they equal only on some finite interval? In this case, from negative 1 to 7, that's more of a mystery. I mean, we saw why it works if you believe the geometric series formula. We saw why it works if you believe the ratio test formula. But that doesn't verify the endpoints. And we, we saw what happens with the graph in terms of the dog wagging its tail near negative 1. It only does seem to be work, working for between negative 1 and 7 somewhat mysteriously. But it, it's, I think it's amazing that it works at all past 3, besides at 3, that you do get equality of the original function and infinite sum on some interval. Let's do another example backwards. So this, we're, this time we're just, just doing the backwards way, not the forwards way. I guess I'll do it over here. Oh, let's see. Let's let f of x be let's make it be 4 over 3 plus 2x squared. I would like to approximate this function using polynomials and maybe an infinite series when x is close to to make it be close to Well, how about x is close to 0? Keep it simple here. Could I use this formula right there? <coughs> is it possible to use that formula? The flies in the ointment are, there's not a 1 there, and there's not a minus sign there. Well, okay, no, sorry. I'm not right. Let's see. Factor just a three out. 
and initially write it like this. You can put the, the three up top as a four thirds up top. You can make a plus of minus by doing this trick. These tricks are valid. These things are all equal to each other. But by doing the tricks, I have been guided by the fact that I want to get it in the form A over 1 minus R for some A and some R. A is 4 thirds. R is negative 2 thirds x squared. By this formula, used backwards, this evidently is a geometric series with A equal to 4 thirds. And again, R equal to negative 2 thirds times x squared. So it should equal what I'm writing here as long as the absolute value of R <coughs> excuse me, is less than 1. There's R. This is true. If the absolute value of negative 2 thirds x squared is less than 1, which is equivalent to the absolute value of x squared being less than positive 3 halves. The absolute value of negative 2 thirds is positive 3 halves. There's positive 2 thirds, then multiply both sides by 3 halves. You get to this. This is the same as the absolute value of x squared. So now take the square root of both sides. The absolute value of x must be less than the square root of 2 thirds here, which is not a nice number. That's OK. It's less than 1. Evidently, our interval of convergence here for this power series is centered on 0 has a radius of square root of 2 thirds, which you could also write as square root of 6 over 3, by the way. I hope you can you know, figure that out. I think it might be square root of 3 halves. Oh, thanks. Sorry. Square root of 3 halves. This is R equals square root of 3 halves, which is bigger than 1 which is also the same as square root of 6 over 2. We're not going to include the endpoints here. The interval of convergence is the open interval between those two values. We do not include the endpoints. Can mathematics help us believe this? Sure. same kind of game up here that we did there. We could let f of x be this, the function for, let me type it in in the original form, 4 over 3 plus x squared, plus 2x squared. So I'll type it in the original form. This nth partial sum of the infinite series, also called a Taylor polynomial for this function, centered at zero in this case, because there's we're not doing x minus something, we're just doing an x. This can be probably as x minus zero. The uh, first term there is four thirds. Let me replace this five with the four thirds. Then the other terms can be thought of as four thirds times negative two-thirds x squared to the k power. Negative two-thirds x squared to the k power. Which can be simplified, by the way. You can write x squared to the k as x to the 2k. I guess I would leave the negative two-thirds in there as it is. So these graphs should be close together, the graphs of these things. Um, 
when n is large, Pn is a finite sum, it's not the infinite sum, so the graphs are not exactly the same. So I want to do a manipulate again. Probably should use a different um, interval here. Close to zero. Square root of 6 over 2 is a bit bigger than 1. Let's just go from negative 2 to 2 here. And get rid of the exclusions. I'm not sure how high to go. Probably not very high, actually. That function f of x doesn't get very large on this interval. Uh, I guess it's highest at 0. When x is 0 there, it's going to be a value of 4 thirds. So we could just go, say, negative 1 to 3 as an okay interval to use here. So the red graph is f of x, the blue one is the Taylor polynomial of different degrees, and as n increases, the graphs get closer and closer together. And now it's like a two-tailed dog, or the dog's wagging its tail and its head at the same time. And the graphs are a better and better match, but only for certain values of x, only when x is close to being between negative 1 and 1. This is square root. You know, it's probably like 1.1 to 1.2, somewhere in there. That's the radius of convergence of the interval. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm just going to say, if you wanted a better picture for that graph, you could say it's like a bird flapping its wings. Oh, yeah. OK. Good idea. Very good. Um, do they match up exactly when you consider the infinite sum. Sum doesn't converge on the whole interval, but it does converge on a subinterval. I think we will get a graph here. I think. Yep. They are the same. This this value there is negative square root of 3 halves, negative square root of 6 over 2, and this one is positive square root of 3 halves. They are the exact same function on that interval of convergence. And their derivatives will match up. I can do this kind of thing again. Except I've got to plug in 0 instead of 3. The derivatives for the finite case, for the finite Taylor polynomials, Subtle point here, and I forgot to make it earlier. These derivatives only match up at the center of the interval of convergence. If I went away from the center to like x equals one half, then these derivatives don't match up. I should have mentioned that before. Though with the infinite sum, they would match up. Wait, so why wouldn't they match up at one half right there? I'll tell you in a second here. Let me just see first of all that for the infinite sum they do match up. Including at one half. Oops. Ah. I tried to do an undo there and it didn't work. For the infinite sum, they do match up at a half. For the finite sum, they don't. The finite sum is only matching up the, the function value, the derivative values, first, second, third, fourth derivative, at the center of the interval. It's not a guarantee that they're going to match otherwise, because the graphs aren't matching either, except right at the center of the interval. But for the infinite sum, they do match over the entire interval because the functions are equal over the entire interval. They matched at zero for the finite case, but not at some other number that's not the center of the interval. But for the infinite case, for the infinite sum, they do match even at some number that's not the center of the interval. The functions are only approximate 
when they're finite sums, they only approximate the function. When, when you get an infinite sum, then they equal the function. In general, a Taylor polynomial of degree n for a given function is a finite sum and a Taylor series and it is an infinite sum and we want to be comfortable with both ideas given a nice function f by, by nice I mean it has infinitely many derivatives at the point in question or near the point in question x equals a Okay, if I just say that, no, right? This function's got infinitely many derivatives at a. It's defined in nice on some little interval near a. The Taylor polynomial of degree n approximating f of x near some point x equals a a was 3 in our first example today a is 0 in our second example if you write it out without summation notation it looks like this it's f of a plus f prime of a times x minus a plus f double prime of a over 2 factorial times x minus a squared plus f triple prime of a over 3 factorial times x minus a cubed etc. Then f quadruple prime of a divided by 4 factorial times x minus a to the fourth and I've got to stop at degree n. The last one would be the nth derivative of f at a, which notationally is written like that, divided by n factorial times x minus a to the n. This is the nth derivative of f at a. A is a particular number, like 3 or 0. 0 is the most common thing to use, actually. In summation notation, <coughs> you could write it like this. K goes from 0 to n. The kth derivative at A divided by K factorial times X minus A to the K power. The Taylor series for f of x just takes this finite sum and makes it an infinite sum. Instead of stopping at the nth degree, keep going forever. It's a series. Taylor series for f near x equals a is the exact same thing where the plus but dot dot dots are at the end and don't put a last term. And with summation notation, you put an infinity up there. This FKA is the kth derivative of f at a. This is standard notation with the parentheses around it. It's not a power. It's a derivative. We, we can't draw k primes without putting, without emphasizing that somehow there are k primes in there. That's sort of unpleasant, especially for typing things out. I haven't 
justify this formula. I mean, where did where did these derivatives come from? Why why use these derivatives and why divide by k factorial? I'm not going to justify it in general today, but the last thing we do is let's just verify that it's working with one of our examples here. Let's take the second example here, where f of x was this one, 4 over 3 plus 2x squared. This is going to be our f of x. I got the Taylor polynomial in this case by realizing f of x could be thought of as the sum of the geometric series. That's how I got this. It was the manipulation we did over here. But I also can get the exact same formula by using the formula that's on the board behind the screen here that I just wrote. Let's look at the formula in this example for p tan of x. There it is. A little tricky thing here. This is not a degree 10. This is not the 10th degree polynomial because because of the x squared in there, and that x squared is what was raised to the 10th power here. So you actually get an x to the 20th. So even though n was 10 here, the degree of this polynomial is 20. Is, for example, this coefficient of x to the 16th correct? 1,024 over 19,683. If it is correct, I should be able to find the same thing by taking the ratio of the 16th derivative of f at 0 divided by 16 factorial. You ready? On Mathematica, I can actually do this without primes, but it's going to be more fun with the primes. Ready? Count with me. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. 16 derivative at 0, divided by 16 factorial. Drum roll, we should get 1,024 over 19. Three. What? Did it do it? Ah! Didn't I type it in? Drum again? Come on. What? What is giving up? Ah! Okay, let's try it in some other one. Let's try the fourth derivative at zero, divided by four factorial. Hopefully it's 1627. Please do it. What? Oh! Is it because the do you have that upper subscript thingy? Could you just not do it and just put it? Oh, I bet you're right. Ah. Yes, don't do that. Okay, let's go back to the 16th one. Sorry. Hang with me. 30 seconds here. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. I hope I counted right. Oh, 1024 over 19, 683. Yes. Thank you so much for catching that. Okay, yeah, don't put it in a superscript in the button. 